Good morning, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of Friday Morning at the Fun House. We've got Martin Popoff in the house once again. Good morning, my friend. Yes, yeah, morning. Canada sir. today. <laughs> oh, it's cold. Winter's coming. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I don't know what it is. Outside, fifty, maybe fifty-five, something like that. It's. It's yeah, a little yeah. brisk. It's. Am it's amazing how like two weeks ago it was like you know eighty degrees, and now it's like. But the sun's shining and yeah, yeah, it's very nice. Pools Science. closed, yeah. the leaves are starting to turn colors. Yeah, you know, it's fall. Whatever. It's Halloween season. That that's that's exciting for me. Yeah, so for uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, today we've got a pretty fun show for you. We've got uh, an interesting concept about this um that first song on an album that kicks things off with a bang, and you're like, all right, great. This is going to be a great one. This is going to be a real humdinger of an album. Humdinger? Does anybody use that term anymore? I don't know. Who cares? Uh, but then you get to track two and three and four and five, and it just goes quickly downhill. So first song killer, rest is all filler. We've each got 10 picks here for today. Uh, and just let me preface this by saying I'm sure there's going to be plenty of you out there who think some of our picks are a little crazy, that you love these albums start to finish, and we get all that. But remember... Uh, beauty is in the ear of the beholder, right? So we all hear music differently. So uh, I'm interested to hear Martin's picks. He wants, he can't wait to hear mine. I'll have Martin kick yes, us off with his number sure, 10. Yeah. yeah, it's funny. I, I did a similar concept to this in my History in Five Songs with Martin Popoff con, uh, uh, podcast, uh, but it was actually even more severe. It was like the, be the, the first song on their first album is arguably the best song they ever did, period. So there's some neat differences here because this can be any any album. And um, and we, we don't, you know, the funny thing is, well, so, so when I did the podcast thing, I mean, the first song could be their most famous song or biggest song, but there could be other really great songs throughout. In this one, we're kind of inherently saying that we think these albums suck because if it's downhill on two, three, four, five, and six, and seven, all the way to the end, it's not a great album, right? Right, so, right. Uh, because if you only have have to go down and you got eight or nine more tracks, so pretty interesting. But but it was neat pulling some of these out. Yeah, um, I, I think the only caveat here is that you know these albums might be saved from total suckage because that first song is so good, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but uh, so my first one and, and some of mine, actually, I'm surprised have that same severity that I did in the podcast episode where this is the first song of their first album. Now, granted, and, and in some cases, it's the biggest song they ever had. And so let's start with this one, Face Dancer, This World. So this was a band that was started in, in Rhode Island, the University of Rhode Island. They only made the two albums. Uh, sadly, the lead singer from uh, the de debut was uh, diagnosed with cancer in 2004 and he, he died shortly thereafter but um and this is uh this is on rock candy a Derek oliver thing but the first song on this album is red shoes and i remember growing up as a kid and hearing that song on the radio even out of Cre uh, creme fm in spokane washington and there's some good songs on this and obviously Derek oliver who's a legend in the uk and has some great taste with his rock candy records i uh, thought it was good enough to reissue uh, there were some other good songs on this the sphinx um time bomb there's some heavy stuff on here but they only made the two albums and really the only the only big hit was was the first song and then it was kind of uh all downhill after that so there you go face dancer i've never heard of that band before and that the other album that you showed it looks like a yacht rock group kind of right yeah yeah i know yeah oh, i wanted to mention so this red shoes song is pretty interesting it reminds me a little bit of a cross between like donny iris and Ram Jam, Black Betty, and a little bit. I don't know if you knew the band The Kings, who had Switch into Glide. It was a big hit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. kind of a post post punk uh not well new wave kind of thing Reminds, remind, they reminded me of the romantics a little bit yep. but but so it has a little bit of that uh gospel start stop uh you know many parts uh feel this red shoes song and it was a pretty cool song and like i say it was on the radio a fair bit so yeah switching to glide was a uh, was played quite a bit on the local rock radio station mm. here in the hudson valley back okay. in the early 80s and i remember you know them and donny iris you would hear all the yeah. time and and these are you know acts that you know the general public doesn't has no clue where they are but those the, yeah, yeah. it was great to i mean we're going back martin to uh, to an age where fm rock radio played some good yeah. music and yeah. they played stuff that wasn't necessarily you know like what we hear now the same yeah. songs over and over again so. good old donny iris right alia and uh yeah the high love and it, the mighty love, love is, is like, like a rock. rock. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember like hearing those songs and thinking, wow, this is the coolest. And you see a video with him and you're like, what is that yeah. buddy Holly? What, what's going on here? That doesn't look like right, the same yeah. guy. Bit of an Elvis Costello thing going on. Yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. 
All right, my first uh, pick of the day is uh, Pat Travers Radioactive. Yeah. You know, this is a follow-up to Crash and Burn, which, is the, which was the follow-up to the live album, follow-up to all those great 70s albums. And you started to hear on Crash and Burn Pat's, like, fascination with, uh, you know, the Rastafarian lifestyle. And, I'm, you know, there's all sorts of stories about uh, him and the band smoking lots of weed back in the day and whatnot. And you heard little, little bits of reggae. There was even a reggae cover, a Bob Marley cover on there, whatever. So they come out with this album. And I remember before this hit the streets in the record stores, uh, they were promoting this in all of the, uh, the magazines, like the Hard Rock and Metal magazines. And this was always like, you know, because this was a Mercury polygram and there's like this and the rainbow straight between the eyes and Uriah Heap Abominog and Scorpions yeah. Blackout, all the heavy hitters coming out of the Mercury late. So I remember going and buying this and thinking, all right, you know, New Age Music, the first song that was being played on the radio. Great song. It's got that kind of like it's it's got a reggae feel, but it's like amped up with lots of metallic guitars. And, you know, Pat's got the, the chorus and the flanger on the guitar. And it sounds really cool. Great chorus. And then the rest of the album is completely unmemorable. And, I, you know, I can probably give a pass to my life is on the line and I just want to live it my way. Those are, they're not awful. At least there's some good guitar work on them. They kind of rock a little bit, but man, I can love you. Untitled feeling and love play it. Like you see an electric detective, the whole rest of the album is just so mellow and just not all that interesting. And, you know, sometimes with these like guitar hero albums you can give them a pass because the guitar work is really really great here the guitar work is pretty good because it's pat of course it's got to be good but man the songs are just completely unmemorable and it's just amazing to me i you know i've had this forever i had the lp back in the day and after new age music i'm like okay next next album that's all you need to hear so yeah and, and the cover is great i mean this looks like it should be like pat's greatest album ever it's not by any means yeah. but a great first cool time. all right Okay, well, I'll move it along because I, I promised I'd be brief, so I'll, I'll not comment all the time, but my next one is Head East, Flat as a Pancake, with Never Been Any Reason, their biggest song ever by a long shot. And a great it's, song. It's, I know, it's amazing. It's a little bit, it, it reminds me a little bit of, well, a lot of Steve Miller, but it reminds me a little bit of more than a feeling, like how epic that is and how how cozy and warm and comfortable and cool and all the parts. And again, just like the Face Dancer song, it has a little bit of kind of a, kind of a gospel revival feel to it in, in parts. Uh, an amazing, amazing song, their biggest song ever. Um, you know, it's, uh, this is a band I never got into. I have a pile of Head East albums, right? I got a lot of this stuff, right? And, um, but this whole Midwest sound thing, right? This whole boogie woogie rock and roll, traditional little R&B, little funk, little I don't know what they're doing thing. I never got Head East. I've, I've always tried a bunch of bands like that, but never been any reason is so huge. Where are my notes on this here? So, uh, so yeah, on, on Spotify on that, that song has 14 million views and everything else is on that album even is like 100,000. I think there's one with a, with a little more, one, one at 450,000. There are other big hit was since you've been gone cover of a russ ballard song but uh yeah so this one is as severe as i did in my podcast episode it's the first song of the first album and it's all downhill after that for whatever 10 12 albums that they made yes. so there you yeah, go and and you know who doesn't love pancakes right i mean come on yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because we have a ton of of head east fans who watch the channel and they're always asking me to do a show on head east and i have like maybe four four of their albums on cd i mean i like them but i like you said, they're 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 like a product of their geographical region and time, and uh, I like them. I you know I don't know I like them enough to go complete the catalog, and you know what I'm saying. They're they're one of those bands, but that is an absolutely great song, and yeah, it for sure it, it totally overshadows everything else that I've heard by them. So yeah, all right. Next up for me is man, <laughs> the deed is done by Molly Hatchet. <laughs> uh, I mean, with that album cover, this should be amazing, right? So this is the first album back with for uh, Danny Joe Brown. He was gone from the band for a couple of years. Jimmy Farrar took his place. Danny comes back. Uh, they put that this album. The first single on the album is a song called Satisfied Man. And this this pick is kind of a stretch because even Satisfied Man is so much of a ripoff on what ZZ Top were doing at the time. 
but it was kind of cool, you know, for, for one song to hear Molly Hatchett doing this whole, you know, give me all your love and satisfied man, you almost expect the guitars to turn around. And it's kind of cool. And it was a big hit on radio, but then the whole rest of the album is like that. And it's got the really poorly produced electronic drum sounds and all this, whoa, 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 whoa all this kind of nonsense. And I'm like, what, what happened here? It, like, this is supposed to be Molly Hatchet with the three guitar army and uh, the raunchy Southern rock. And the whole thing is just, and there's a lot of songs on here, like way too many tracks. I mean, uh, straight shooter. I mean, man on the run, the, the song titles are terrible. It's cliche. Uh, but Satisfied Man is still cool. I listened to it this morning. I'm like, yeah, I kind of dig that, even though it's a total rip off of ZZ Top and not really Molly Hatchet like, but I don't want a whole album full of that kind of junk. And that's exactly what you get here. So there you go. All right. More on Molly Hatchet later, but uh, I'll go, <laughs> I'll go with one. I didn't bring a prop out for, uh, because I don't have a copy of it anymore. Lucifer's friend, Lucifer's friend. Um, with the song Ride the Sky. It. All right. <laughs> so yeah, this is a funny one because we've got uh, we've got this German band with John Lawton coming into uh, you know the band and English guy. Sadly, there we go. We and and it's had a couple different album covers, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, and so this English guy comes in, very smart move. So you bring an English guy in to be your lead singer. And uh, and Ride the Sky is so exquisitely recorded and so heavy for 1970. It's like as modern as anything on In Rock or Paranoid or The First Heap, uh, you know, also all 1970 albums. Um, it's got that big, you know, uh, Walls of Jericho crumbling down with the horn sound, you know, the big elephant bray. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. And uh, and yeah, the drumming is great on it. The singing is great. The riff, the production, it's so awesome. And it's literally their most famous song of all time. And it's the first song and their first album. And they're still going today, right? They have so many great albums later on, but they also went through their, um, you know, the next one's pretty heavy where the groupies killed the blues, right? Yep. Um, and uh, but they go through sort of like a like a more accessible phase and a kraut rock phase and a little proggy and, and heavy and, and stuff. But but they never they never did any better, you know, in terms of, you know, being part of the heavy metal fabric as as Ride the Sky track one first album. Yeah, I mean, I think their first album is their best. Uh, yeah. yeah, that is their best song. I do like the rest of the album. Oh, it is a great album. I, yeah. I think I rated it an eight out of 10. It's one of the great heavy albums of, of the early. It's a and little more dated album. than Ride the Sky, but it's all good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, you're. I mean, they change their sound pretty much on every album. They they never stay in the same place twice. Um, and they yeah, you're right. They dabbled in just every style you can possibly imagine. You got to wonder now with John Lawton passing away if that's kind of the end of them because they were making this big comeback. But mm -hmm. I guess we'll see, right? We'll yeah. see. Yeah. All right, my next uh, choice is uh, Journey Trial by Fire. Mm -hmm. So this was the big Ballyhoo return reunion of the, you know, Steve Perry with the rest of the guys in the late 90s. And it's a really long album uh, and lots of tracks, had the big single. But quite frankly, for me, the only song that's really that good is Message of Love, the kickoff song, which is great. It's got all these amazing hooks and great guitars and Steve sounds awesome. And it should have been the big hit on this album. And it's, but it's it's classic, like hard rock and catchy journey, just like the early, late 70s, early 80s stuff. And then there's one sappy ballad, slow piece after another. And, uh, you know, the big hit was When You Love a Woman, which was huge, but I never liked the song at all. And uh, yeah, and you could just tell, we've showed this picture before, where you can tell on the back cover, you got all the band members looking one way, Steve looking yeah, the right, other way. Yeah. What does that tell you right there, right? Yeah, and yeah. shortly after this, they didn't tour behind it. And, and you, you blink and Steve is gone once again. So yeah, message, message of Love, great song, classic journey track. The rest of it, nah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. I'm going to go with one more that I don't have a prop out for. I have props for everything else, I promise. But Gun, Race with the Devil. So Gun yeah, or too. The Gun uh, put out a debut album, uh, self-titled, and then they put out a Gun Sight, which was a mellower album. But the neat thing about Race with the Devil is it's, uh, it's a little bit of a Uriah Heap shuffle 
um it it picks up the first verses the drums are are, are very tame. i have it i don't know where it is <laughs> okay but you know it's 1968 and the song is called race with the devil and it's Great kind song. of like framed properly like a normal modern heavy metal song from way way back and it's got a little bit of the crazy lucifer's friend thing to it it's got this horn thing going on so it feels a little kraut rock at one point but it's more like screaming lord such or arthur brown because it's 1968 um this is the girl brothers i i really like much more the uh the baker gervitz army stuff that's good stuff um but uh but yeah they only made the two albums and the first one's got more notoriety because of that you know ghoulish hellish album cover and the song is race with the devil but absolutely this band never did anything nearly as well they only made the two albums and then and then one you know asterisk claim to fame is is priest covered this song um but it, it was never it was uh, never on an album until they needed bonus tracks sort of thing. And it wasn't a great version. And it's frankly not the greatest song of all time. But for 1968, it's a pretty cool heavy metal, uh, you know, proto heavy metal, important classic. Two very talented brothers who did a lot of really cool things. Um, yeah. The three man army and uh, Baker Gervitz yeah. army. Yeah, it's good stuff. Great guitar player. Uh, Adrian Gervitz. Really good. Yeah. All right. My next one. Um, Jeff Tull on the raps, the mid eighties, notorious album for being the, the one Jeff Tull album that has hardly any flute and hardly any guitar. It's mostly synthesizers. Uh, Lap of luxury is the kickoff track. Good. Typical Tull song. It's got a catchy chorus. It's got, some, it's got some riffs going on. The keys are kind of nice lap lap, you know, it, it's memorable. And then the rest of it is just this, these really short synth heavy mid eighties overproduced songs that quite frankly isn't prog it doesn't really even sound like jethro tull although you know it's ian singing uh yeah this i mean this whole album to me is a complete mistake i i i, I shit all over this album all the time but i do like lap of luxury i think that's a, that's a really good song uh the rest of it yeah radio free moscow the uh, heat european legacy ah no good but uh that first song really good it's killer the rest all filler cool excellent all right all right back back to the ones where i had the props for so um Next one, I'm going with uh, Quiet Riot, Metal Health. Now, obviously, this isn't their first album. It's their third album. It's the first huge album. It's the six times platinum. I picked it because um, I think the greatest song on here from a songwriter's point of view is the opening track, Metal Health, Bang Your Head, the big anthem. Um, because even their other heavy songs on here are a little, they got a little, little too much 70s to them. I think Metal Health is a good stomping, you know, nascent hair metal a classic and then of course come on feel the noises is, is a bigger song by a little bit um but of course they didn't write it um you know and then it was all downhill after that i mean they never really had any much fame ever again and uh because i'm a trooper i actually played condition critical uh right through in the car the other day because i always had a kind of a fond memory thinking yeah it's almost as good as the the first one quote unquote but it's not it's it's yeah. not that good uh it was a little worse than i thought it was with mama we're all crazy now so the whole jump in the shark thing stomp your hands clap your feet now nah, this this was not that good sign of the times is pretty good off of here but i i still think you know they they really captured the uh the zeitgeist with that song and i i noticed i had this tucked into the plastic sleeve of it look at look at this thing all kind of like moldy and beat up uh this is uh <laughs> This is a letter. This is a press release saying Quiet Riot fires Kevin Dubrow, Burbank, February 5th, 1987, multi platinum. Pasha CBS group Quiet Riot has fired its lead singer, Kevin Brew. Uh, Dubrow was announced today, group members, blah, 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 said the split was not amicable and cited severe personality and musical differences as the basis for termination. And it goes on. So, so there you go. There's the, uh, the official notice, right? Wow. So, uh, yeah, that's that's a pretty severe one right there. It never it never got better for them. Yeah. And I think even back in the day when that out for when uh, mental health was so popular, I, I had it um, on LP. And I think after those first two tracks, did we really listen to much of the rest? I don't know. And that, that follow up. Yeah. Oof, bad. bad. Yeah. yeah, I ran into when, when did he leave the band? Do you know do you, what was the date on that? Well, at, at this at this time with that letter, so he only did the two albums. So that was 87 because then I think it's QR3 after that, right? Yeah, I think so. And he's not on QR3. But then he comes back and he's on some later stuff, which is pretty good. 
Yeah, because I ran into him. It was weird in Las Vegas at Caesar's Palace back in the early 90s. I was out there on a business trip and I was walking into a, a restaurant. He come as I'm walking in, he's walking out with this gorgeous blonde and he's completely hammered. And we just kind of stumble into each other. It's probably like 92 or 93, yeah. something like that. So I don't know if he was in the band at the time or not. I don't remember. Hmm. I don't remember. All right. My next choice. Alice Cooper goes to hell. Hmm. Okay. I mean, Excellent. the first track is a <laughs> yeah. Alice Cooper heavy metal classic. I mean, it is. I mean, this is this is extreme as it gets, and there is nothing else on the album like that at all. It's all like a bunch of bland, you know, ballads and soft rock stuff. Uh, and I get it; it's a concept album. It's supposed to take you through all these different moods and things like that. But I don't know. Uh, Go to hell, big stomping heavy metal riff, snarling vocal. I just really don't find the rest of it all that interesting. It's got that really kind of uh, squeaky clean and theatrical Bob Ezrin production. I know a lot of people dig this album, but I think this compared to some of the classes that came before it and stuff he did afterwards, this is pretty much a boring album that is only saved by the one song. I'll keep it brief. That's it. Go to hell. Great song. Yeah. The rest, a lot of filler. Yeah. I'm, I'm playing that song in my head and it reminds me almost like a BTO production where it's, yeah. it's framed on a heavy riff, but it's not, nobody's really playing or recording it all that heavy right yeah it's but kind of kind of odd yeah it's kind of okay. simple it's kind of simple but it's good yeah all right speaking of bto we'll go to canada for our next one helix uh from white lace and black leather so the funny thing here is the debut album is called breaking loose and that's the one that has that song i've raved about to you before billy oxygen absolute classic hilarious song excellent um but um so this is their second album they're still on an indie label they're still on H and S records. There's what the band looks like. Cool rockers. eh? there yeah. you go. 1979. Um, but the funny thing is the debut album is called breaking loose. The first song on this album is called breaking loose yet. It's the second album called white lace and black leather. And when you get to their next album, the first one on capital walk in the razor's edge, it's got a song called white lace and black leather so it's the, so it's a little bit of that old led zeppelin houses of the holy thing right yeah, yeah. Um, but no this is absolutely a perfect one for this because breaking loose is a is a cool heavy metal classic it's got an amazing riff it's not as epic as billy oxygen it's just a solid excellent late 70s heavy metal song and then the whole rest of the record is kind of downhill after that i can't remember there might be one or two other good ones but breaking loose i can play the riff in my head i never forget it when i when i play it it's it's actually it's actually a really cool heavy metal song but their first two albums are a little kind of all over the place and then they get the capital deal and they move on to making some really good early stomping party metal slash hair metal for for those for those big 80s albums so there you go yeah they, they had a couple of big albums there for a while yeah yep. all right well i'm gonna go to, to one from the more modern times uh and this, this is another perfect example of, uh, you know, leading off an album thinking, wow, things are going to be great. And, you know, hoping it'll be great for, the, for this band anyway. Um, but it wasn't really the case. Uh, Life, Love and Hope from Boston. Okay. So, the, so this is, again, a Frontiers release. This came out, uh, oh, geez, I don't even remember. It's six, seven years ago, something like that. The, the first track is called Heaven on Earth. You hear this song, you're like, oh, my God, Boston is back. This is exactly what we want to hear from this band. And then the rest of it is like this demo quality, like hodgepodge of who's on it, who's not on it. Is that like an old used Brad Delp vocal? Is like, you know, it's kind of weird sounding. But Heaven and Earth has got all the Boston qualities we loved on those first couple of albums. The big ringing guitars, the catchy chorus uh you know amazing vocals it's just anthemic and it's like wow you know i remember when i first well granted i when this was first coming out i already had read all sorts of things all over the internet people saying now oh, this album is just as terrible as the last couple but i always give them a pass i always like i'm gonna give it a try and i remember when i finally heard this i was like oh that's a great song and i was hoping for the rest of it to be great and it isn't. There's maybe a couple of others that are kind of mildly interesting, but it just seems like a rehash of the album before and the album before that. And uh, yeah, and then, you know, the cover's cool, but one song, that's basically all you get. Yeah. So weird, eh? It's just yeah. so tragic, the idea of this guy working so hard in these productions and then 
Pete describes as, as as demo quality. And I remember I remember interviewing him and and you know just hearing the belaboredness of of putting these later period albums together. And then you get to the fact that but I'm using drum machines, but every single thing is checked and and perfect, and it's all different and all this. It's like still sounds like a drum machine, Tom. You know, yeah. Uh, it's like oh yeah, it's it's such a weird look at the the uh, psyche and the brain, right? To, to yeah. think this is the guy who cares the most about production in the entire world. He's right. obsessed with it. He's obsessed yet. with overthinking it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, my next uh, choice, uh, I have lots of props, but not the album it came off of, but I've even got two copies of Focus Dutch Masters. I've got Focus Live at the Rainbow. I've got Mother Focus. Couldn't tell you what a note of any of these records sounds like. I've got Focus, whatever that's called. And hamburger concerto. They're all really good. Oh, and here's a second copy of Mother Focus. So two <laughs> copies of it. No idea what's on them. And Focus Ship of Memories. But anyways, uh, the big song, of course, is Focus Hocus Pocus. And it's the first song on their Moving Waves album from 1971. And my fond memories, I think I've mentioned this before, is it was on one of those KTEL compilations along with Brownsville Station and Tony Orlando tie a yellow ribbon and uh, what else? Sweet Little Wind. All, all these all these songs it's like that that is kind of like turning you on to some of these other heavy metal bands like these KTEL albums should i looked up KTEL. apparently it was like a midwestern canadian label that did all did that that put out all these compilations with you know 22 hits crammed on it from god knows where over and over and over again in in the early 70s to mid 70s and they sold a lot of copies of these records um but yeah that's that's where we heard focus hocus pocus with that you know the hilarious yodeling and all that but yeah so first song on the on the moving waves album and it's their biggest song of all time so i i without without even having proof i can tell you that that was the biggest song and probably oh, yeah. the best song uh, on moving waves yeah I, I had a feeling you wouldn't be into eruption the big long 20 something minute long <laughs> track that ends the album which i like quite a bit but yeah yeah i mean focus is an interesting band that was by far their biggest most accessible song but i think they've had a lot more interesting music or songs besides that one but yeah but that's that's the one everybody knows for sure yeah. i think i check out when i turn over the album covers and the songs are called focus two focus three focus i know four. <laughs> or the one song's got 12 sections to it you're like yeah oh, no <laughs> I'll, you'll leave that one for the progress, right? Yeah. All right. Uh, my next one, Bad Company, Desolation, Angels. Uh, it, you know, another kind of similar thing here. You got the big, huge hit starts off the album, Rock and Roll Fantasy. Great song. Everybody loves it. It's one of their top five anthems of all time. Unfortunately, it sits on an album where the rest of it is pretty damn bland by Bad Company standards. And, and I think, you know, you could probably say those last couple of Bad Company uh, albums with Paul singing on them has like one or two great songs and the rest is just kind of like, eh. For me, they never really kind of hit the stride like they did on those first three albums but yeah you know crazy circles gone 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 evil wind early in the morning lonely for your love oh atlanta blah. no not good but you know rock and roll fantasy is a classic it's a classic rock staple and uh, you know it's a good sounding album it just unfortunately the songs just are not there's nothing on here that's mandatory bad company by any means other than that first uh, track on here so you can tell already yeah. that the, the kind of the wind was coming out of their sails at this point the big yeah. super group yeah it's Rock and roll fantasy is one of those songs. Do you ever have like this, this collection of 25 or 30 songs that just pop into your head over and over throughout your entire life, like three, four times a day, rock and roll fantasy is one of those. Like just, yeah. it just pops into my head constantly. Yeah. You know, it, the, it's the, the riff it, and yeah. Yeah. The whole thing. It's a classic song, you know, whether you're sick of it or not, it's uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's got, it has its, uh, it has its legacy for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, back to Alice Cooper. And uh, the School's Out album. Uh, so, and there's the, uh, the, the panties that came with it, right? Um, so the School's Out album is, uh, is notorious, actually, in the catalog for being in a little bit like Muscle of Love, but this one even more so. This is, this is the album of all of those that, you know, it is a classic period Alice Cooper album. We all know that. No problem there. Um, but... Um, you know, it, it didn't have the repeat cool songs and anthems that Billion Dollar Babies or Killer had uh, on it. And it kicks off with Schools Out. 
which is one of his biggest songs. It's an amazing song. It's a complicated, cool, heavy metal song. It's an anthem. It's got the kids and the, uh, you know, the choir and the bell ringing and a, and a great kind of story to it and all that stuff. But the rest of this, Alma Mater, Blue Turk, Grand Finale, Gutter Cat versus the Jets, Looney Tune, My Stars, Public Animal Number 9. Honestly, I, I wrote an Alice Cooper book, and I can't, I can't think of how a single one of those nine songs, eight songs, seven songs goes in my head right now. Uh, literally, I, I can't picture a single tune uh, from here other than Schools Out. So that's that's pretty bad. But we know the other albums uh, all had classics, even Love It to Death. Uh, obviously, Welcome to My Name, everybody's the solo artist of all time at, at that time. But yeah, this one gets kind of put together a little bit with Muscle of Love, where uh, it's saved and it sold well because of one smash song. I am with you 100% on that. I, I love all those albums around it. <clears throat> and I have always found most of that album pretty uninteresting. Yeah. And not very Alice Cooper. Like, I mean, it's just very, I don't even know how you describe it. It's like kind of like vaudevillian. It's kind of, kind of yeah. very cheeky, silly type stuff. And you get the one big hard rock and anthem that starts it all off. And the rest of it's just like, yeah, yeah. I don't get it. I, and I talk to people all the time who think that's one of the best Alice Cooper albums ever. Mm. I, yeah. I personally don't get it, but whatever. All right, we're going to go again to something fairly recent here. Uh, yes, Fly From Here. Okay. Great uh, Roger Dean artwork adorning this. Uh, um, well, I don't know what you would call the album. Uh, it starts off with the big epic title track, which is actually pretty cool. Uh, you know, I remember when this first came out, produced by Trevor Horn, I was like, yes. Yes, is getting back to doing some, you know, the epic stuff that we all know and love from them. And uh, it's got like, what, like uh, five, six parts, whatever the hell it is. It's pretty interesting. They've also re-recorded this uh, in recent years with Trevor Horn on vocals uh, or remixed it with him on vocals because this had been Watt David, who was, the, this was the only album he sang with the band on, a uh, Canadian singer. But the rest of it, it's just like the man you always wanted me to be, life on a film set, uh, hour of need, solitaire, into the storm. Just more of that kind of lackluster, bland, not very interesting, not very progressive guest music that we have <clears throat> seemingly been getting for years. I'm hoping the new album will prove me wrong there. But uh, I do know there are a lot of Yes fans who like this album quite a bit. Uh, I sometimes wonder if they like it just for the title track, which I think is good. Uh, it's pretty good. It's, it's best for me. It's the best thing they've done in a long time. But the rest of it to me is just, uh, yeah, complete filler. There you go. Fly from here. All right. Cool. Okay. Uh, my next one, <clears throat> Alda Nova with Fantasy. Uh, this album came out on Portrait. Uh, what is the year on this thing? 82. Yeah. Um, it went double platinum, this album. Fantasy is by far the biggest song on Spotify. It's got 11 million plays and everything else drops down. And there's one on their ball and chain, 1.2 million. Um, and then uh, then things drop. You know, he goes gold on, on the second one. Uh, Twitch doesn't even certify it goes gold in Canada. He's from Canada. I think it's Montreal. But Fantasy is your... Sounds like Jefferson Starship Jane, right? Yep. Um, and it's a little bit Sammy Hager band yep. uh, of that period. It's a little bit heavy John Mellencamp. It's a little bit Night Ranger, but not as complicated. But this is just a sort of a sort of a lover boy. It's a little lover boy. Um, so it's kind of like a slash between uh, a cross between pomp rock and the very early days of hair metal, maybe that 82, 83, 81 period where it's worth way more friendly than the rat great white quiet riot version twisted sister version so this is kind of kicking it all off with that that weird kind of part in time and, and he had a big hit with this he was a huge you know double platinum hard to believe that album is double platinum wow but. yeah and so yeah as again severe like um like my episode of history in five songs it's the first song on his first album ever and it's all downhill from there yep yep yeah that he was a big deal there for a short while, right? The yep. next, the next big thing, right? <clears throat> All right. This one again. This is kind of a stretch, but I actually really like the first track. Uh, unfortunately, the rest of the album I think is pretty much a dud. Uh, giant for a day, gentle giant. Okay. Often, uh, you know, claim the worst album in their catalog, and I would absolutely agree with that. Words from the wise is the opening track. Fun song snappy song great hook uh it's a little light for is, gentle yeah. giant not this big you know complex prog you know great melody 
Excellent What's that? melody. Great yeah, melody. Yeah, really good melody, right? It's very catchy. It's just like, wow, you know, Gentle Giant can write like a kind of like, a, I don't know, like a Doobie Brothers track. It's not the Doobie Brothers, but you know, you know what I'm getting at here. Uh, but the rest of the album is also really kind of light and whimsical and just, uh, you know, it's only goodbye, no stranger, little brown bag, spooky boogie. I'm sorry. Boogie and Gentle Giant should never be talked about in the same sentence ever, let alone on an album. Uh, the title track is not even that good. I don't know. It all loses steam after words for the wise, from the wise, which again, really cool track. It's kind of quirky like the band is, but um, yeah, the rest of it, I just find just completely uninteresting and really the only clunker in their whole catalog because everything else is, uh, is top notch in my book. So there it's you interesting. Go. That, that one almost strikes me as their loosest album where they, they were always loose, right? They were always imprecise with the vocals and, and, and the performances were kind of rough and the productions were pretty, pretty downscale. Like they were like, they were like prog on the seat, on the seat of their, on the edge of their seat sort of thing. Right. They did prog it well. by the seat yeah. of their pants. Right. It yeah. was just always kind of, kind of quirky and just, and just like, dangerous and let it let it out there right yeah. it, and, and they didn't clean up anything all that much and that one really you you really feel it in that one it is the quirkiest right it's really quirky this is like their sunday sunday morning sitting having a cup of cup of tea and reading the newspaper and playing their instruments around the patio that's kind of what this yeah. album is like it, it's just yeah, I, I don't know. There, there's 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 no real danger on this album. It's just it's very gentle giant playing it safe, like looking for hits. That's that's the thing that I get from this album. And maybe that was a record label thing. Um, I don't know. But uh, yeah, it's just not very interesting. But the great first track. It's a fun song. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so my last one um, back to uh, back to Molly Hatchet. And um, this will this will be my protest about how, you know, I, I often say I love modern day Molly Hatchet more than older Molly Hatchet. And, and it's true because I find these records, I, I, I'm going to use this word again, a little overrated, but they're rated high. So they're still good, but they're just, you know, they, they I think they're a little overrated. Um, and so this is the uh, so so you go, you know, the the, the big one or I mean the debut, really the, the bigger one is um, Flirtin. Flirtin went double yeah. platinum. Yep. And then you get beat, Beating the Odds, which is the first one with Jimmy Farrar. Um, but I, I really, Beating the Odds is another one of these where all I have to, all I have to hear is those three words in any context. And that song goes through my head, just like that, right? It's so catchy. Yeah. And it's it's heavy. Again, it's it's not recorded properly heavy. This is one of Tom Werman's weak period production albums where he's where everything's timid, right? Yeah. Um, and that's kind of the problem with these albums. But but I went and played this album again, and obviously it's a it's a good solid meat and potatoes southern rock album, and there's all sorts of like good southern rock on it and stuff. But beating the odds is them getting a little metal and it's a little up up tempo, and it's just got a great groove to it, and it's uh and and it's a very very catchy song so it's the first song in the album it's the title song in the album but i literally had to go play the whole thing again to even remember what anything else was like on it but uh, there you go beat me it's a really short album is it and, yeah and you know i almost went with the follow-up take no prisoners because quite mm -hmm. frankly i think bloody reunion is the best song on that album and it kind of goes mm -hmm. downhill after that although i think yeah. i think take no prisoners is a little heavier sounding than beating the odds for me i don't know right but, yeah um, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think uh, I think back in the day we we had this opinion that those Molly Hatchet albums were a little heavier than they actually were because I find when I listen to Molly Hatchet now the old stuff I still like it a lot but it's I. I I had this impression that it was heavier. Like I always remember like Molly Hatchet was the heaviest of all the Southern rock bands. Yeah. I don't know about that. You know, I think Blackfoot and even Skinner to an extent had them beat, you know, yeah. I think, you know, the three guitarists, you, Oh, it's gotta be heavy. Yeah. Three guitar yeah, players. Yeah, right. Exactly. I don't know. Yeah. All right. My final pick for the day is uh Nazareth two XS. Mm. Okay. Yeah. You know, I was, uh, I was a fan of this band before this came out and I remember seeing this, sitting in the rack and i was thinking yes all right i've got some fire on the front got the the, the cool logo still there you know two excess means got yeah they're gonna go go for the jugular on this one. First track love leads to madness a terrific song it's not heavy but it's arguably one of uh nazareth's best uh kind of like you know hard rock pop songs amazing hook great guitar work dan sounds incredible on here and the rest of the album 
pretty much sinks without a trace other than you know maybe back to the trenches is kind of cool it's the only really like even remotely heavy song on the album uh you know maybe mexico is kind of interesting but man boys in the band you love another games dream on ah, just it's very uninteresting and this would start a trend of pretty uninteresting nazareth albums unfortunately but uh i think they kind of left their their like heavy rock era at the end of the 70s and they basically moved into the 80s and they wanted they, they seemed to me they wanted to be more of like a bluesy band that played pop music i don't know just but uh, yeah. but love leads to madness terrific song i still can listen to it today and i'll hit the replay button over and over and over again it's that good yeah and nazareth definitely you know you think even in the 70s i mean most of those albums probably the first song in the album is one of the biggest and best and you know most most beloved songs you know and i, and I guess it, it raises a point like why you know why what is the strategy? Do you want to put your very best song first? I mean, I guess most labels would say yes, or do you want it a little bit later? Or do you want to make a statement and try to push something else first? And then, so there's all this, all this sequencing politics that goes on. Right. But Nazareth was definitely a band that I think, you know, I even think of, uh, was it was playing the game? Is it somebody to love on that Razmanaz with Razmanaz and, and hair of the dog with hair of the dog. Yep. Um, so yeah, they 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 did that, and I I suppose most bands kind of do that, but it's it's pretty funny when it's uh you know definitely it's funny when it's the first song off the first album ever, and then it's all downhill after that. So I'm, yeah. I'm amazed we found some more of those. You know, when it comes to Nazareth, they they might be one of the greatest bands ever who have so many albums that are so spotty. Like Nazareth is held in high esteem by a lot of people, <laughs> myself included. Yeah. But most of most of their albums, even the '70s ones, have some great songs and some really lame songs on every single. Like, can you name like yeah. one album of theirs yeah. where every single song is just absolutely killer? Yeah, I, I couldn't. Yeah, definitely not. No, no. Even Hair of the Dog has yeah. got a couple that are like you know, eh, you know. I mean, that might be their strongest one, top to bottom. Yeah. But all the rest are like pretty spotty, I think. Yeah, and they were just so obstinate about we don't want to be put in a box so we'll just do whatever we want if we like it it's going on there they were absolutely one of those bands you know zeppelin i guess always talks about themselves yeah. that way too right yeah. yeah yeah give them credit for that i guess so there you have it everybody first song killer rest is filler hope you enjoyed this one if you think we've uh, missed out on any obvious choices please put them in the uh, comments below and uh, Martin, what have you got cooking on your end? Books, podcasts, uh, contrarians? What's happening over on the, in your world? Actually, I'll just mention, I had this in my notes. So, so the five examples I had in my episode were your I Heap Gypsy. Um, so on that album, but again, I was saying best first songs ever, like for the whole catalog, arguably a grace. Max Webster, Hangover, Ramones, Blitzkrieg, Bop, Montrose, Rock the Nation, and Angel Tower. Wow, those are all great choices. Uh, yeah. yeah, Montrose, absolutely. Angel, absolutely. You, you could arguably even put Boston more than a feeling as well. Yeah. Well, I, I like other songs better, but I think yeah. that for many people that could, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, just working away on, on some uh, book projects I suppose I can't talk about yet. Still waiting for my shipment, but I hear it's in Toronto, so I'll be getting that soon. So that's the Nazareth uh, visual biography and there's some yes in there and i've still got the heap one so that's all at martinpopoff.com marco promises to get the rat episode of the contrarians up uh shortly he just did a patreon exclusive on kiss hot in the shade that's about it and i, I guess this weekend i got to come up with another episode of history and five songs so there you go <laughs> It never ends, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. Stay tuned for album homework assignment on Sunday. We have, who do we have this week? We have Jack Toledano going head to head with uh, Anthony Ferraro. That should be lots of fun. So stay tuned for that. And then, of course, Monday starts the week all over again with the Hudson Valley Square. So for Martin Popoff, I am Pete Pardo. See you all here tomorrow all right uh, and martin and i next friday so take care everybody thanks for watching bye-bye